Thank you, Gilly. So this work um, builds on a sort of long-standing uh, collaboration between myself and Eric. Um, and we've been uh, using video methods to look at what goes on while people are driving, um, and also why um, it can be this technical problem, it can be this practical problem, but also at times driving can even be an emotional problem. It's no accident that uh, when we're navigating in a car, it's sometimes like, site of, of, uh, of family disputes and arguments. Um, in some earlier work at CHI, uh, we looked at the natural normal troubles of driving with, uh, with GPS in cars. And what's, I think, perhaps slightly distinctive about our work is that we focus on real-world driving situations as much as possible. So one of the criti there's two criticisms we made in earlier work uh, on some of the work in this field, we believe there's an over-focus on safety. Now, while that's understandable, uh, it is, after all, at times, a dangerous situation to be on the road. Um, it has come to dominate the, our characterizations of what the driving activity is. And secondly, we have um, criticized the over-reliance on simulator uh, data and simulator situations, which can miss out very uh, many important aspects of driving, such as the role of passengers as co-pilots. Okay, so we're in this absolutely mad situation. There is a massive worldwide field study going on of autonomous driving. We have the Google car, which I'm sure you're familiar with, and other cars by other uh, manufacturers. But we also have Tesla's autopilot function, which is driven over 140, miles, 140 million miles worldwide in autonomous mode. So there's this unsupervised field trial going on all around the world with um, relatively little access to the data and experiences of those cars on the road. Um, we have some reports on accidents from certain regions in the, in the US, but we actually don't have much access to what's actually going on with these cars uh, when, they're, when they're meeting other drivers on the road. Similarly, uh, I think there's been um, kind of recent interest in using YouTube as a method of collecting data in the CHI community. And we, for this work, uh, wondered if it was possible to use YouTube videos of autonomous cars to try and inspect what's going on. Um, now, if you look at, uh, if you just do a search on YouTube for, uh, for, for self-driving cars, you'll get many videos of the Tesla in its autonomous mode. You'll get many uh, videos of the Google car and some of the other uh, competitor systems. Um, and you get these kind of setups here. Now, some of them are really quite elaborate. Some uh, drivers put multiple cameras in their cars. They have these sort of different viewpoints going on, or they record very long drives. So we felt that perhaps we could use YouTube in this case to get some early, early data on what's happening with these autonomous cars on the road, really get some kind of access to this, this uh, the what's, what's going on there. Um, of course, you probably have a little bit of hesitation about using YouTube data. If you're anything like me, I, I'm used to sticking cameras in cars myself and, 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 and using those kind of collecting data that way. And clearly, you have much less control over the kind of data you're getting. For this, uh, for this piece, we, t we managed to collect 10 and a half hours of uh, the Tesla autopilot and the Google self-driving car. And while Obviously, we had less control over the data. We did have this, this ability to get a more diverse data from more countries and also, indeed, a kind of more diverse set of different situations. We collected data on critical moments, i.e. near misses, that, that you wouldn't perhaps get from the normal, uh, kind of, uh, normal uh, methods. And also, we um, managed to get actually some quite long clips that really were very much comparable to the kind of data that we've collected in, in other situations ourselves by putting cameras in the, in, the, in the car. Also, you might think about the similarity between people uh, talking while they're driving in, on a video they're making for YouTube and the sort of think aloud tests that we're sort of familiar with um, in this field. Okay, but let me just jump in and I'm gonna talk you through some of the videos because I think they bring out what's going on here uh, uh, most clearly. So what's going on between the driver and the autonomous function? And, and if you're driving in a Tesla, you can put it into autonomous mode and it will steer uh, and it will accelerate and, and brake the car automatically for you. So let me play a little clip here of a driver monitoring their car as it's going along. Um, so we'll see what it does. Yeah, just a tiny bit of nudge towards that. 
um, but hardly anything. It corrected itself, basically. I mean, before, I mean, it was, the first time it went through this road, I mean, it would almost lurch. I had to grab the steering wheel, and it was kind of like every one, I had to sort of be ready, and eventually I could keep auto steer on, and I would just sort of hold the steering wheel where it was supposed to go. Sometimes it would deactivate, because it really wanted to get off, and sometimes it wouldn't. Um, but now it's just, um, you know, I, I'm still ready to take over, but here comes another one. But I'm not, you know, like there, just a little bit, a little bit of like, oh, do I take, no, I don't take it. So, I'm not sure that's the exact voice that autopilot thinks in, but it's probably close. And, um, see it learn. Oh. There, that was a pretty big lurch. That wasn't me at all. So it lurched over and then it corrected itself. Um, so apparently it doesn't know that one very well. But in its defense, I'm usually not passing that one. So you have some interesting characterizations of the car. It's learnt, uh, has certain, certain features. Um, but the thing I wanna kind of focus on is this interesting way in which the car is continually monitored by the driver. Now, much of the literature sort of uh, characterizes autonomous driving as being essentially a distracted driving, as a driver not being engaged in any way. Um, and what was kind of unusual, and I, I'm not really sure exactly what to take from it, in our data we found that drivers would be continually changing the target speed of the car or the distance it would leave to the car in front. There was a continual monitoring of what the car was doing on the road, like you can see in that clip there. Why would they do this? Well, they would do this because at least with the current generation of systems, if you don't watch the, what the car is going to do, things can go terribly wrong. A little bit nervous. Oh, it exited me. I didn't want to exit. <laughs> the car will take a wrong turning for you. Um, and this is one of the reasons why, in, I think in our videos, we have this kind of continual monitoring to make sure that the car isn't going to do something that's navigationally consequential. But it gets worse. You don't want to watch that clip too many times, do you? So with these ongoing interactions between the driver uh, and the autonomous features of the car or assisted driving features, we also have this question about what's happening between uh, the car and the other drivers on the road, because that's also a kind of point of interaction, isn't it? So what's going on? Now, one of the interesting things about this data is it kind of brings out some of the mistakes that, uh, that these autonomous systems make on the road. Now, in this case, this is a, a driver is driving along, and with the Tesla, you can, um, uh, you can signal, you can do a signal, and the car will automatically uh, work out when it's safe, and it will actually do the, the maneuver of moving into the next lane for you. But of course, sometimes it doesn't quite get things right. Pulled in ahead of that guy, and from what I saw, it wasn't something that he was exactly encouraging. Um, let me break that clip up a little bit for you, because I, I want to sort of talk a little bit about what's, what's going on on the road there. So the driver's hit the indicator, so he wants his Tesla to move over to the next lane, uh, I think in part to help this, this car, which has just, just merged onto the, onto the highway. Um, and you'll see um, that there's a car behind him, I've indicated it there with a the big arrow, and the car is coming up in that lane that the, the driver wants to move the car into. The driver stops, uh, this dr driver who's behind, pauses and waits and offers a space for the Tesla to move into. Now, of course, the Tesla has no awareness of this kind of behavior on the road. It's essentially just tracking where the cars are on the road. And it doesn't see that as an offer. Nothing happens. So the car continues, and as the car continues and comes up, the Tesla then decides, in its infinite wisdom, to actually then move over and cuts the other driver up. And then you get this comment about, well, 
uh, you know, wasn't too pleased with that, that, that maneuver. So you can see that there's been a bit of social interaction on the road that the Tesla couldn't see. That interaction was an offer and then a snub. Um, clearly, movements of our car on the road when we're driving aren't just simply the maneuvering of our car to get to a destination. They're interacting with other drivers, signaling intent, making offers, even more complex aspects like being aggressive or rude or, or polite. Um, now let me move on and I want to show you a couple of clips of the Google uh, self-driving car. Now these are clips, uh, the, the, the clips that we analyzed were uh, mostly clips where other drivers had gone past the Google car and they'd started filming the, the Google cars they saw on the road. This first clip, though, is actually from um, a talk given by uh, one, of the, one of the Google chief engineers at the time, who's talking a little bit about what the, what the Google car can do and how, uh, in his view, idiotic other drivers are when they're interacting with the, the Google car. And of course, we have people who do I don't know what sometimes on the road, like this guy pulling out between two self-driving cars. Play that one again. What you see is that there's two Google self-driving cars and they leave some space between the two cars, and the car behind is moving quite slowly, and this driver then comes out from uh, a side road and maybe pushes his way in. And of course, we have people who do I don't know what sometimes on the road, like this guy pulling out between two self-driving cars. Now think about this earlier example about how other drivers can make offers by showing a gap on the road. Now, the Google car, by hesitating uh, and offering and perhaps making a gap that would be untypically large, um, makes an offer. Makes an offer that if you're perhaps an aggressive driver trying to get over to the other side of the road, you can squeeze your way through here and it, it wouldn't be too, too problematic. And indeed, this is really one of the biggest problems that uh, the current uh, level of autonomous cars uh, feature is they're very hesitant on the road. They offer, they, they, they have large gaps between them and the, the drivers in front. And this can sometimes be um, seen by other drivers as, well, I'll just nudge in, behind, in front of it because there's a, there's a gap there. This can also be seen, this is a, a clip, there's a car behind uh, the Google car, and the Google car comes up to a junction and hesitates. A couple of other cars go in front of it, and then you actually have a, a little bit of a near miss because you have the, the car moving and then stopping. So I'll play that once again. It says, you see the car coming up. It misses its turn in the junction, so a bunch of cars go in front of it. It then moves, and then it's actually, its exit is blocked on the, in the intersection. And the, car, the driver behind moves and then stops again. Uh, oh, sorry. This is, one of the, um, this is one of the accidents that um, uh, learning drivers often get, where they get rear-ended by another car because they're, they're too hesitant on the road. And the crashes that the Google car has been in have actually been uh, rear collisions, where the car's been too hesitant on the road. Now, I don't want to, what I'm being said here to be, uh, sound like I'm being necessarily critical of the, certain, the current level of these cars. Um, the state of the art is moving really, really fast here. This was a, a clip from uh, Mobileye, who are one of the leading companies in this area, using machine learning techniques to try and uh, simulate more human-like driving. And I think this is really quite striking. They're controlling the cars in this intersection. You see movements that are actually quite similar to some of the, the, the um, analysis that we've done of, uh, of humans driving on the road. So I'm not making criticisms of the the current level of these systems, I'm sure they're going to get better, just to perhaps to say that it's maybe unlikely that they're going to move as, as fast as some people have predicted, but rather that there is also some of these ongoing challenges that these cars need to understand social interaction on the road if they're going to be able to drive um, successfully. Okay, so in the discussion section, there's three kind of points that we use to draw this data together. First, we really think this uh, assistance uh, is a really interesting uh, research topic for Kai, and really one that we can think through, I think, in different ways about how, uh, the, how this kind of relationship can play out. And I don't really think it should be thought of as being passive, non-attendant driver, or 
uh, you know, attendant driver. It's a much more kind of complex set of interactions going on there. Secondly, um, uh, in the AI community, there's been much interest in this idea of, uh, of systems having a transparency of communicating what they're, uh, what they're actually uh, doing. And we think actually an old CCW notion, which is that of accountability, might be more useful in the design work here. We might want to think about how cars account for themselves on the road and what sense other drivers can make of those, uh, of those movements. But lastly, and I guess this is our overall point on the, of the paper, the road is a social space where there are ongoing interactions between drivers. And if we have cars that are unaware of the, the, those meanings and those communica that communication that's going on, we may provide cars that can safely get through the, car, through the road, but we'd cause the great cost at the sort of driving that, that, that other drivers have to face. You're going to have the situation where you have cars that really are not understanding much of the, the social interaction that's going on in the road and producing very poor, although perhaps nominally safe, driving. Thank you very much. Oleg Magorzev, uh, Texas State University. So I, I wanted to make a comment where you asked a question about Tesla cars, you know, how come the driver was, uh, how come the driver was so engaged? Well, I'm, uh, I have a Tesla Model S. And so usually, I mean, you're so excited about the car that you're really are paying attention. I mean, those people who put videos and interact with the car, they're really, you know, watching all those algorithms. And I think, uh, that's why you see so much engagement with the car, where it's, you know, if autonomy is a normal everyday thing, then people just would not pay attention anymore. Yeah, we get, I mean, there's, there's, like I said, in the corpus, there are quite long clips uh, where there's people aren't driving for the autonomous functions in, you know, 40 minutes uh, bursts. So um, I think the, the point we're making is not that people are or are not engaging, but that if you don't engage, then the, you'll have, it'll have consequences. Um, and one of, the, one of the most serious consequences, of course, is the driver who died who, when this car was in, 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 uh, in autopilot mode. Although that said, I think that that may be one of the lessons to take from that is actually how unusual that situation is, perhaps not how typical it is. Um, okay. Thank you. Alan Lin from Northwestern University. Thanks for the talk. I like the idea of the thinking about road as a social space. Um, I remember when my dad taught me how to drive, the, the thing that she said distinguished the novice driver with the, uh, from a veteran driver is the, in the ability to interpret the intent of the other drivers on the road. So like seeing if others want to chime in or, or if they want to switch lane. So do you see um, estimating the I intent of other drivers as a ways of, you know, um, maybe implement the ideas of the thinking about uh, the social road and uh, what are the directions that we should do um, in terms of that? Thank you. Um, yeah, thank, thanks. Uh, um, I think I would go a little bit beyond just intent to, to sort of say, you know, communication so more broadly. So, for example, making an offer goes a little bit beyond just showing intent, but of course intent is one, uh, you know, aspect like that. For example, nudging uh, can be is, is a clear indicator of intent. So I think it's going a little bit beyond uh, and ascertaining intent to actually understanding um, what interaction might be going on. Hi, uh, Chris Janssen from Utrecht University of the Netherlands. 